Thanks so much for joining with us. With one week to go, it's down to the wire. The Senate race in Georgia is neck and neck between Democrat um, Senator Warnock and Republican Herschel Walker. Well, Walker continues to hold his ground even after a second allegation about abortion. To shore up Warnock, Democrats are bringing in heavy hitters such as former President Obama. Matt Galka reports from Georgia. Herschel Walker continued his bus tour throughout Georgia with promising poll numbers the final week before the midterm elections. He's lying to y'all. He's saying that he's your senator. And I'm telling you, no, he's Joe Biden's senator. He's not Georgia's senator. He's Joe Biden's senator. Democrats enlisted the help of former President Barack Obama to try and dent the momentum of Walker's campaign and push incumbent Raphael Warnock over the finish line. Who will fight for you? Who cares about you? Who sees you? Who believes in you? That's the choice in this election. A second woman's abortion allegation has put Herschel Walker back on defense in the closing days of his Senate campaign. But just like the first, he's calling the latest allegation a lie. Well, I'm going to tell y'all, vote for me. I'm going to get us all to the promised land because I can tell you, we can get there together. The news about a new accuser claiming Walker pressured her to get an abortion during the 90s broke during a Walker campaign rally last week in Dillard, Georgia. I'm done with this foolishness. I've already told people this is a lie and I'm not going to entertain to continue to carry a lie alone. On the campaign trail, his pro-life stance, even amid the allegations, appeals to some of his supporters. I understand he had some issues early. Uh, we all have had issues in our youth. But I, I'm for the candidates who want America to be the country I was raised in, not the country we've become. Walker has been quick to tell voters not to buy what Democrats are selling, frequently mentioning Senator Raphael Warnock, the economy, and crime. Think about this. He believes in no cash bail. That means they just walk through the jail like a revolving door. Not on my watch, they're not. I want my letter to say that I stood up for a livable wage, that I stood up for voting rights, that I stood up for civil rights. Warnock has not made Walker's abortion allegations a central part of his events, focusing instead on health care and voting rights. I wrote the provision in the Inflation Reduction Act to cap the costs of insulin for folks on Medicare to no more than $35 of out-of-pocket costs per month. Something Black Voters Matter Fund co-founder Latasha Brown says is a significant issue for Georgians, especially minority voters. Here, and it's really around health care, you know, and I think abortion is a part of that reproductive health care and repro access to reproductive health care is a part of that. But it's not just the, on the, I think, on the single issue of abortion. It's really around the expansion of people having access to quality health care, whether that's access to the hospitals, whether that's access to the care itself. An election is a choice. And the people of Georgia <clears throat> deserve to see that choice. Because in this case, it's stark and deeply consequential. I think if you want to know what somebody will do once they're in office, just take a look at their life before they ran. The damaging headlines have not slowed the campaigns down, and recent polling shows the two men virtually tied. If that holds and neither one gets more than 50 percent of the vote on Election Day, then they could be heading to a December runoff. In Atlanta, Georgia, Matt Gelka, CBN News. Well, CBN chief political analyst David Brody joins us now for more. So, David, are we looking at a, a runoff? Is this going to be tied so close that we're going to need another election? It's very possible. It, it could be that way, but there are danger signs for Raphael Warnock, and it, and it resides in the African American community. You know, Stacey Abrams, who's running for governor down there against uh, Brian Kemp, won African the African American vote when she ran for governor in 2018 by about 90 points. It was like 94 percent to 5 percent over Kemp. Uh, if you look at what's happening this time around, she's down among uh, black voters. Uh, Raphael Warnock also down among black voters. And what do I mean by down? I'm talking about at this point, the data suggests that uh, Raphael Warnock is getting about 67 to 70 percent of the black vote in terms of a, uh, a lead over Herschel Walker. It's about a 70 percent 
uh, 70-point lead. Uh, he's got to be at an 80-point lead. He's got to be at 85-point lead. That is not good for Raphael Warnock. Uh, and so that's what we're seeing. I'm looking at Gwinnett County. I'm looking at Cobb County. Those are those uh, suburbs outside of Atlanta, Georgia. That's going to be key. And right now, Raphael Warnock is not doing what he needs to do in the African-American community. And that could be a problem uh, against Herschel Walker, who is very popular with conservatives in getting many of them out. Uh, do you got any predictions for the turnout in Georgia? It, it, it seems like we're going to see a, a massive uh, voter wave uh, where, where people are really taking this election seriously. Are we seeing that in Georgia? Yeah, not only are we seeing it in Georgia, but they're breaking record numbers there, uh, for sure. Now, a lot of people then ask the follow-up question, which is, well, what does that mean exactly? We're not quite sure. Uh, obviously, we, we don't know. Typically, Democrats obviously outpoll Republicans, but in the last week of mail-in voting, typically Republicans start to uh, outnumber Democrats. So it, it, we're, we're just not quite sure at this point. No reason to speculate, but the numbers are historic. All right. Well, Republicans hope they can flip the seats in Nevada and Arizona. So tell us about those elections. What's the key? Yeah, well, there's a couple of keys. Let's start in Nevada, uh, where uh, Cortez Masto, Catherine Cortez Masto, uh, is struggling with the Hispanic vote. She is the first uh, Latina U.S. senator, you would think, right? I mean, that's the, 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 the normal kind of narrative storyline out there, that she would do well with the Hispanic vote. That's not the case. There is a poll just out in the last couple of days, Gordon, that shows Adam uh, Laxalt, uh, her Republican challenger, actually beating her among Hispanics uh, statewide. Oh. And then you've got Clark County specifically there in Nevada, which of course is where 70% of the voters reside right around Las Vegas. And she's not doing there uh, well there as well. There are a lot of service workers there, a lot of Hispanics uh, in, in that group. And because of the economy, that is hurting her specifically in Clark County, a place that she normally would do well. And then there's Arizona. Uh, and look, Mark Victor, who is the libert libertarian candidate, uh, just uh, endorsed Blake Masters. He was polling at one to three percent. That race is tight between Blake Masters and Mark Kelly. You put the one to three percent uh, into the Blake Masters column, and all of a sudden, Blake Masters has a real chance at flipping that seat. So those are two big flips if the Republicans can get it in both Arizona and Nevada. Is he taking himself off the ballot? Is he still going to be on the ballot? No, I don't believe he will be, though. I'll have to double check that as it relates to the regulations and rules out there, uh, specifically in Arizona. His name may just be on the ballot because it can't be uh, erased at this point. I'll have to double check that. Uh, but he has endorsed Blake Masters, and that's the key. All right. Well, Rick Scott, he's the chairman of the National Republican Senatorial Committee. He's supposed to be a, a cheerleader for the cause. Uh, he predicts the GOP will win anywhere from 52 to 55 seats in the Senate. So is, is that a realistic expectation, or the, do the Democrats have a better chance? Well, uh, Gordon, you're absolutely right. He is uh, kind of put in that role of cheerleader. And so 55 might be cheerleading quite a bit. Uh, 52 uh, is, a, is a definite potential. But look, this is how he gets there, all right? So, so just not to geek out and try to keep it relatively simple, but there are four seats Republicans have to hold in the Senate, uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, 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 Wisconsin, and um, North Carolina. If they can hold all four of those, which at this point it seems likely that they will hold all four of them, then, and they're at 50 seats right now, uh, the way they get to 55 is you have to win, as we talked about, Arizona and Nevada. That's a, those are two flips. Georgia would be a flip. That's 53. And then the, where he gets to 55 is he thinks that the Republican can win in New Hampshire, the Senate seat there, Maggie Hassan, uh, in very tight uh, waters there. And then the big stretch, but Wait, uh, th there's a great storyline going on in Washington state where Tiffany Smiley, the Republican candidate, could unseat uh, Patty Murray, uh, who's out there in Washington state. She's been a, a, a senator for, I don't know, 30 years or so. Uh, so that is a possibility. That's a real possibility. Democrats are concerned. They're spending a lot of money out there. So if all of that happens, that's how he gets to the 55. I'm not convinced on Washington state, uh, but I tell you what, uh, anywhere from 52 to potentially 54, is is doable at this point that 
is surprising. All right. Yeah. Well, David, thanks for joining us. Thanks for the insight. Uh, we're a week away from the election. We're going to have special coverage on the CBN News Channel. Uh, you can tune in to watch that. The best way to do it is to download the CBN Family app. Uh, there's also a CBN News app, but the live coverage will be uh, broadcast on election night, so you can tune in to the latest as uh, this is probably the most significant midterm election of my lifetime. So make sure you vote. Uh, make sure you participate. Uh, the more Americans that participate, I think the better outcomes we get. In other news, more than 40 Russian missiles rained down on Ukraine yesterday, targeting the country's critical infrastructure. 80% of Kyiv residents lost water. Many have no electricity. And to find the danger, a group of American missionaries is bringing help to keep Ukrainians warm this winter. Chuck Holton reports. Rolling blackouts are hitting Ukraine's capital for the first time since the beginning of the war. Here in the city's largest power plant, technicians are working day and night to repair the system under constant threat of renewed attacks by Russia. There was not a single military object among the targets. Not a single one. The enemy wants ordinary citizens to have neither water, no light, no heat, to watch them freeze and die in front of the whole world. We have to be very careful about what we film when it comes to the power infrastructure because everything power related in Kyiv right now is a target. But the Ukrainians are working very hard to put together teams of people who can fix things that get broken very fast. The situation is quite difficult. Up to 30 to 40 percent of the energy infrastructure have been damaged in some way. The energy system is manageable. Together with the emergency services, we are renewing the damaged substations. I am absolutely sure that once the en masse assaults have been stopped, it'll take us from two to three months when we find ourselves in a situation when the consumers will not be under any restrictions. So far, the residents of Kyiv are enduring the sporadic outages without losing their spirit, bolstered by news about continued gains by their forces. Kyiv will stand, Ukraine will not fall. Everyone from uh, the office of president to the municipal worker, men and women, united. Uh, some on the battlefield, some in the rear. We believe in ourselves. We have nowhere to retreat, nowhere to go from here. We are defending our land. But closer to the front lines, in many liberated settlements across the east, this winter will be more than difficult and without modern conveniences could be deadly. All the normal things that they can count on for winter, that's all been disrupted. And, you know, it's going to be very difficult, I think, for a lot of people to survive this winter. These American missionaries are stepping into the gap with a fleet of vans to distribute aid to remote villages near the front lines. A couple of us got a harebrained idea and said, hey, let's buy some vans. Let's see what happens. And now we have seven vans and uh, we've had 40 drivers come out so far and it's been awesome. Driving supplies into an active war zone carries a hefty amount of risk. But these volunteers say their calling is greater than the danger. None of us get paychecks to do this. We're all volunteers. A lot of us spend our own money to fill gas tanks, buy hotel rooms. We're willing. We've all made that choice of like, hey, this might cost us our life, but it's the right thing to do. Ultimately, we believe that God's just led us to do this and that his promise isn't to keep us alive, it's to be with us. From Ukraine, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. What incredible bravery. It may cost us our lives, but it's the right thing to do. These are words to live by, and I just admire what they're doing. For Ukraine, uh, the message has to be, for, for all of Eastern Europe, the message has to be, God sees you, God loves you, God wants peace in your region. And it's the same message for the Russian people. He wants peace. He loves you. He doesn't want to see this kind of war. 
Let's pray to him. Let's believe that he can provide peace in that region. Let's stop this horrible war. There's a winter coming with infrastructure out. People's lives are at stake. Let us not kill the innocent in this. Let's have peace and, and try to build a better future. Let's cry out to God. He's the only source of this. And so when we realize his eyes are on you, he's waiting for your cry, and his heart is overpouring with love for you, he loves you tenderly. It encourages your faith. It encourages you to believe for the future. There is hope, but that hope is in God. Five children in six years. Michael and Candy Pewter know a thing or two about raising a family. Married 33 years, they're now passing that knowledge on to young parents through a program called Nurture Generation. It's based on a strong foundation of faith and a solid relationship in marriage. Brody Carter explains. She just stood out. That's amazing. She stood out so much. After 33 years of marriage, Michael Pewter still remembers the day he met his wife, Candy, for the first time at a church Bible study. She walked in in a, in a royal blue jacket, coat. Full length. It was full length all the way down. She walked in with a little well-worn Bible in her hand, and I just went, she's beautiful. As they began their life together, the Pewters wanted to know how to make love last and how to honor God with it. You know, one of the things we began looking at is what does God want us to look like as a family? When, how does he nurture us? How does he train us from being an infant Christian and bring us all the way through that childhood growth to maturity? And we began to lay out a vision for our kids. After having five children in six years, Michael and Candy found no playbook in the Bible prepping parents for sleepless nights, temper tantrums, and the overall stress that accompanies family life. When we were having issues with our children, and you can only discipline so much before you're pulling out your hair, and you cry out to God and say, God, what in the world is going on here? They found their answers by calling his name. And we just started crying out to the Lord, and God started showing us what we needed to do to organize our house and to um, train our children. One of the things God showed us from the get-go was yeah. that God is a God of order and he is very organized and he is very calculated. Through diligent prayer, Candy says the Lord gave them a 30-year vision for each of their five children, one that nurtured them using biblical principles. Candy says it blossomed from simply writing down their desire for the children's temperament. Children are a gift to us from God, and what we do with them is our gift back to Him. And we wanted to give God a really good gift. We wanted to give Him children that were healthy, that were educated, that could worship Him, that knew the Word, that would obey him. Over the years, they experienced God's blessing on their family and found if nurtured with biblical discipline, that blessing becomes generational. Today, the couple is teaching others how to raise future generations for God. Nurture generation is a vision to see a man and a woman, husband and wife come together whole, made whole, and then for them to raise healthy, godly families. So thank you for joining us here at Nurture Generation. They started the program in August in hopes it will become a resource for the church. Nurture Generation shares training and education for parents on how to approach everyday issues from a faith-based perspective. We've done more parenting to our kids when they're in their 20s than I think we did all along because they have lots of questions and they're walking through life and they, they, wanna, they want someone to talk to, somebody that can mentor them through the hard things of life. Their content provides lessons in inner healing, deliverance, and training on basic biblical principles. Well, it does no good to try and fix a child when the parents are still broken. As the pewters expand, they plan a podcast and hosting church conferences with hands-on training. The Word of God says children are a blessing from the Lord, and yet, we treat them like they're a curse. And um, we want to change that. We want to change that element in the family and in our country. 
While there's no such thing as a perfect family, the Pewters believe that you can experience a similar blessing too, saying it starts with intentionally working on your marriage and then feeding your faith so you can show your children what it looks like to walk with God. Brody Carter, CBN News. Well, if you want to find out more about Nurture Generations and how you can build a strong family, there's more information on our CBNNews.com website, and you can go to there and get that. Let's pray for America. You know, the, some of the things that we just saw in that story, how we've de-emphasized the family. We, we don't seem to want our children. Uh, we don't seem to want to realize that blessings flow through generations. It's through strong families, strong fathers, strong mothers, uh, that children get the image of God and get the image of how they can grow and to be in the image of Christ. All of these things seem to be eroding, and uh, the most disturbing part of it is there's now a sense that the state knows better, the school, public school knows better, um, that you know we're we're here to look out for your children. Uh, we we want the state to somehow become the parent. Well, that's not God's plan, and it hasn't been His plan since the Garden of Eden. He loves to work through the generations. That's why you see all the genealogies in the Bible. Where do you come from from a family standpoint? What are the blessings and the announcements that God has made over your family line? These are very important things. And when we come together as family, well, then God comes into that and his spirit dwells there. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. If there are problems in your temple, ask him to fix that. If there are problems in your family's temple, ask him to fix that. He loves to get out of the walls of the church, out of the walls of uh, any kind of temple and say, no, the whole intent was for my spirit to be in you. Here's a verse to consider. It's from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Talk a lot about liberty in America. The source of all liberty is the spirit of God. When he is rightfully enthroned in our families, rightfully enthroned in ourselves, and we're paying allegiance to him and saying, I want to live by your commandments, your directions. I love your spirit operating in my life because when it is, that's when I get true liberty. We're praying for America. We're praying for 40 days. So stop what you're doing right now. Join with us in prayer. Let's ask for the Spirit of the Lord to be poured out on us individually, on our families, on our neighborhoods, on our cities, on our states, throughout the whole country. May the knowledge of the Lord cover America as the waters cover the sea. If you don't live in America, pray for your country, please. Let's make it the whole world having these wonderful experiences where the Spirit of the Lord is, then there is liberty. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we come to you. We come to you as the answer to every human need. And Lord, if there's anything within us, anything that we're doing that is not of you, that is not pleasing to you, we just ask now to forgive us and to cleanse us from this unrighteousness, to wash it away, to make us new again. And Lord, now fill us with your spirit. Breathe on us again so that we may live for you. We ask for this for ourselves. We ask for it for our families. We ask for our neighborhoods, our cities, our states, and yes, we ask for our nation. May the knowledge of you cover our nation as the waters cover the sea. And Lord, may the knowledge of you cover me. May I be baptized in it as the waters cover the sea. May I be baptized in the experience of you. Do it, Lord, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you want to join with us as we pray for the country, 
All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000, or go to PrayForAmerica.com. Let us know that we can count on you, that you'll be praying for our country. When you do, we'll send you a prayer flag and a Pray for America bumper sticker. So if you'd like it, just call us, 1-800-700-7000, or go to PrayForAmerica.com. Terry? Today, Vanessa Orbuena captivates audiences all across the country with her powerful speed painting events. Yet her career as an artist almost never happened. For years, Vanessa lived a lonely and troubled life, and she tried to end it by suicide. I remember the shame, extreme loneliness and depression, feeling like nobody even cared. I didn't know what it was like to have a, a day without feeling that loneliness and abandonment. Vanessa Orbuena is an accomplished artist and speed painter who works to inspire hope and positivity through her passion for painting. However, her life growing up was anything but positive. Vanessa longed for a genuine relationship with her mother. She was dealing with the grief of losing her mom, which was really hard on her. And then also her and my father's relationship was not so great. She was a little more checked out, just emotionally not present. I had a hard time believing I was loved. Well, I'd watch other um, parents with their children, and I'd remember thinking, wow, like I wish that was how my mom was with me. The pain Vanessa felt was only compounded when at five years old, she suffered sexual abuse at the hands of certain family members. I had a really, really low self-esteem. It affected my view of men in a major way. I felt very um, on guard with men. The abuse was kept secret and continued periodically for years. Vanessa's trauma eventually turned into anger as she started lashing out at her parents and getting into fights at school. Out of desperation, her mother sent Vanessa to a Christian youth camp when she was 13. There, she experienced the love of Jesus Christ. The first thing that really hit me was the, the encouragement. I just really responded very well. And I was like, wow, this is like, I feel like God's people are amazing. And if this is what God is like, this is what, I mean, I just love him. I gave my life to the Lord and totally came back a different person. Vanessa stopped fighting and put her energy into learning more about God. Her passion for art also developed during this time. Inspired by an older sister in cartoons like The Lion King, Vanessa started drawing. I would feel centered. Um, so it was just a very, very personal, peaceful experience, um, expressing um, how I was feeling or um, things that I really enjoyed through art. Just as Vanessa's attitude and morale began to improve, her home life took a turn for the worse. Her father was caught in an extramarital affair and her mother left the house as a result. The split hurt Vanessa deeply. It was very difficult for me. I had this relationship with God and yet I was, you know, struggling with depression and I attempted suicide at the age of 16. I felt a sense of hopelessness. Vanessa survived her suicide attempt and then went to live with various family members and friends. In spite of everything, she still loved God and eventually got involved in local outreach ministry. That's when the emotional and sexual trauma of her past began to turn into something else. I was 19 years old when I started to struggle um, with my sexuality. I felt safer with women than I felt with men. And so that was a difficult thing for me. And I remember feeling so sad to know that I was disqualified from living out my life for God. Vanessa made sure not to tell anyone. She isolated herself, stopped her ministry work, and gave up on art for eight years until she couldn't take it anymore. I hit a rock bottom where I just was like, I need to get counseling. So I went to counseling with one of my senior pastors. I started to understand just by talking to him where things were coming from for the first time. The pastor reminded Vanessa of God's endless love and compassion. I realized that, that God was, was gentle and kind and that he was gonna walk me through it. 
It was amazing because I didn't leave feeling, you know, shame. I left feeling, feeling empowered and like free. I felt light. She was also encouraged to pick up her art again and not just drawing, but to try painting as well. So I went home and I set up my easel, I set up my paints, and in two and a half hours, I had finished my first painting. I loved it. So yeah, that's how that, that gift just came flowing back into my life. I was like, I am a painter and I, I love it. Vanessa continued to attend counseling and says she overcame the same sex attraction she fought with for years and is now comfortable around men. She also reconciled with her parents who restored their marriage and became born again Christians. For the past nine years, Vanessa has pursued a successful career as an artist, painting Christ-themed pieces. She speed paints at events across the country while listening to worship music. Vanessa says it was only God who was able to heal her wounds and give her life purpose. He's brought me through. I no longer you know, have the same struggles that I used to. I know that I am loved by God. To be in His will, to be in relationship with the Lord is to me the ultimate fulfillment in life. When I worship God, it's my relationship with God on display, basically. People will say, I felt the Holy Spirit when you were painting. I could never thank the Lord enough for all that He's done. But every day I do the best that I can to just love on Him and show Him that. What a powerful gift, what a talent, and it might have been lost. You know, coming to the understanding of who we are in Christ and just as powerfully or more powerfully who He is in us changes everything. Knowing we are loved by Him, that it is an unconditional love and our identity is connected to Him so strongly produces amazing things. Maybe some of you have struggled with that. Maybe you're believers and you're struggling with various things in your life that are ch challenging your identity in Christ. We would love to share this information sheet with you. It's called Your Identity in Christ, God's Power in Your Life, because when you discover it, when you connect with it, it changes everything. This is available to you. Just call our toll-free number. I know you've called for things before. It's 1-800-700-7000. Call and say, I would like the Identity in Christ information, and we will get this out to you right away. But Vanessa should be an inspiration to all of us to stay connected to the one who defines who we are. He loves you so much and he is always so available. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN news break. A big development in the Biden administration's attempt to revive a nuclear agreement with Iran. A White House official says making a deal is no longer a priority. According to Axios, U.S. envoy to Iran Rob Malley said the administration is not going to, quote, waste time on the agreement right now citing the growing protest in Iran and the regime's support for Russia in Ukraine. Mali said of the nuclear talks, it is not on our agenda. We are not going to focus on something which is inert when other things are happening, and we are not going to waste our time on it. Axios is also reporting another administration official tells them President Biden is ready to use military means to keep Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. In Israel, voters are going to the polls for the fifth time in less than four years to elect a new government. The latest surveys show former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu with a slight edge to form a coalition over current leader Yair Lapid. However, the polls are so close, it's possible Israelis might find themselves voting for a sixth time if neither of the top parties can form a Knesset majority. Regardless of who they voted for, many Israelis told CBN News they simply want a government that is stable and an end to the political paralysis. For election results and more there, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Lillian lived every day in fear that her baby would die. His cleft lip and palate made it difficult for him to breathe or eat. So Lillian placed her tiny boy in the hands of God. And before long, he received the help he needed. When Soon Gwen was born, his mother Lillian cried, not for joy, but for fear. 
The day I gave birth, my baby and one other were born with cleft lips and palates. The other baby died. I was so scared. I thought my boy would die too. Sun Gwen survived, but every day was a challenge. Although he is a happy baby, he often struggles to take milk or even breathe, and he sleeps very little. I place Sungun in the hands of God. His name means victorious, and I believe he will be victorious. Lillian took Sungun to Kabuye Hope Hospital, which is supported by Operation Blessing. Soon, Sungun got the surgery he needed for free. He was victorious. This is a miracle. To me, this was a big problem. But for God, it was small. He is so handsome and strong now. Through you, God answered my prayers. As he grows up, I will remind him of what God did for him. Thank you for helping us. May God bless you. That blessing goes to you if you're a member of the 700 Club. You're part of that wonderful surgery. If you're not a member, I invite you to join with us. It's real simple. All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. Say, I want to join the 700 Club. A portion of every gift you give to the 700 Club goes into the work of Operation Blessing to help people. And we need long-term support. That's why these centers are able to be established and be maintained that when people's needs get surfaced, like that wonderful need, I mean, I, I can't say the cleft palate's wonderful, but it's wonderful to be able to help them and say, yes, we can step in, we can fix this. There's a, a surgery that you can have that will give you a life, give you a hope, give you a future. We wanna be there for people in their time of need and we need your help. So if you'd like to join, call us, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, yes, you can count on me. Some of you can join at higher levels. We have 700 Club Gold. We also have 1,000 Club, which is $1,000 a year. 2,500 Club is 2,500 a year. Founder, $5,000 or more a year. Whatever level God is speaking to you to give, call us, 1-800-700-7000. Now, when you call and pledge, I've got something for you. It's a new teaching on Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. This will go verse by verse through the Psalm, get into the Hebrew meaning of the words. It'll be a comfort for you. Uh, and you'll realize, yes, indeed, the Lord is my shepherd. Cheers when you join, 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Pneumonia, nausea, and heart arrhythmia. Jeff Blackwell suffered from these conditions and more all at the same time. Shortly after arriving at the hospital, Jeff fell into a coma, and that's when his family and friends put out an urgent call for prayer. Uh, it may be mostly cloudy on the outside, but the sunshine's shining through on the inside. So uh, let your light shine today. Here on Jeff Blackwell has been a beloved on-air talent for Catholic Community Radio in Baton Rouge for many years. But in 2020, Jeff was in a fight for his life. After going to dinner with his wife, Diane, he became violently ill. I knew I was sick. I had never felt that bad before in my life. I, I couldn't hold anything down. And I finally told my wife, I've got to go to the ER. I just can't, I can't handle it. Jeff was then admitted to a local hospital. He was later transferred to ICU, where his stomach issues persisted. The amount of bile my stomach was producing was through the roof. Uh, in fact, they had uh, uh, removed nine and a half liters of bile. Jeff was then prepped for a routine CT scan that went horribly wrong. I got very nauseous and I told the technician, I said, I'm about to throw up, you need to get me out of here. Before they could even start backing the table, I aspirated bile into my lungs. Technicians saying grab the, the crash cart. I mean, they started seven tubes down my throat. At that point, I had passed out. The aspiration resulted in a spiral effect that had Jeff's family concerned for his life. He had issues with his heart rate being able to stay in the correct rhythm. It was uh, kind of bouncing all over the place. And so they needed medications to manage that. Uh, he was on medications, uh, you know, for the pneumonia nausea and vomiting, uh, which then led to the aspiration pneumonia uh, event. And uh, those certainly can be very fatal. My heart went into AFib. My kidneys started shutting down. My liver had become compromised. My uh, 
uh, lungs had become ulcerated, I had pneumonia, and it was just almost hopeless at that point. He was so dehydrated, his potassium levels were so low at that point that his body was actually, you know, like really too sick to really handle his lungs being burnt at that point. As Jeff's condition worsened, Diane contacted David Dawson, president of Catholic Community Radio, who then informed their listeners. We had a pretty big prayer line going. I mean, it grew and grew every day. A lot of people knew Jeff, and not a, a lot of folks loved Jeff, and, and the business that we're in, it, it just kept growing. So we just kept passing it down the line. Every time she say, this is a great day, it's like, great, we're gonna, we're gonna keep praying, we're gonna pull him through, or this is a bad day, it's like, well then tell us exactly what to pray for. In my mind, I couldn't be trusting God and looking for the doctors at the same time because my trust was in God to heal him. Jeff slipped into a coma and was put on life support. Diane continued to believe for his healing. As she was praying in the hospital chapel, a book caught her attention. When I opened it, it opened immediately to the page where it's the, it's the woman that uh, in the Bible, she was hemorrhaging and she was like, if I could just touch on Jesus' uh, cloak, then I'll be healed. And it's like, Lord, you worked a miracle for her with just a simple touch. So work that same miracle for Jeff. At one point, doctors told Diane she may want to think about making funeral arrangements. The doctor came in and just showed me some x-rays and said his lungs are bad again. It's filling up again. And so you need to call family in and you'll need to decide if y'all want to um, pull the plug on him. My son-in-law made a comment like, hey, Mr. Jeff, you gotta get out of here so we can barbecue. And Jeff gave just the tiniest little smirk. You could see it. And I looked at them and I said, you saw it? And they said, yeah. So I was like, no, we can't let him go. Diane uh, is a very, very strong, strong, strong woman. She wasn't going to take no for an answer. After several weeks in ICU and a coma, Jeff woke up. I hadn't no idea how long I had been in the hospital. And when I came to, the very first thought I had in my mind was, people are praying for me, I just knew it. Doctors finally found the source of his original illness, a kink in his intestine. It wasn't until a month after that they took care of it with, through emergency surgery. Although he had more challenges to overcome, Jeff eventually made a full recovery. Today, he is healthy and back on the air at Catholic Community Radio. The power of prayer, it's real. He had a group of prayer warriors praying for him to get him through that, to give him the strength. I think that played an immense part in his recovery. By the way, coming up, uh, leaving later in the hour. It's really remarkable. Uh, people still to this day will say, I was praying for you when you were sick. I heard about that. I was just amazed at the fact that God actually blessed me with a total miracle that I got to witness it with my own eyes. There's no reason why Jeff is still walking this earth. There's no reason for that. He had too many strikes against him. From the world standpoint, uh, there was no hope. However, that trust in God which is far deeper than, you know, a commitment than I can even explain. To be able to say, Father, I trust you. I trust you with my life. And, and let go and let God. Our God in the midst of us is mighty. I mean, all, all eyes on an impossible situation. And then God enters the scenario prayer going up, people beseeching heaven on behalf of this mound that they respect and care about and love, and everything turned around when God came. And then, you know, Jeff talked at the end about how important that trust is, where you can know that you're loved so much, where you can know and understand the attributes of so much that you can let go and trust that God has you in his hand. Many of you wait for this time in the program, I know, when we have an opportunity to pray for you, and we want to do that now. We have some other answers to prayer to further encourage you in your faith. This is a, an answer to prayer that came in 
just this month. Blaine has been suffering with TMJ for over 15 years. On the morning of September the 6th, it was so painful, she told herself she needed to wear her mouthpiece. She was watching this program, and as she got up to get her mouthpiece, she heard you say, Gordon, someone, you've got a problem with your left jaw, TMJ. It locks up, and you can't open your mouth properly. God is healing you of that. Just open your mouth wide. Receive what he has for you now in Jesus' name. So Blaine prayed along with Gordon and just opened her mouth to receive the healing. Within 30 minutes, the pain was gone, and she has had no more pain since that day. Oh, wow. Hallelujah. Every dentist will tell you that's a miracle. Yes. Here's Vicki from Aberdeen, Washington. She fell and injured her left hip. It was making popping and cracking sounds. Well, one day on the 700 Club, Terry had a word of knowledge that God was healing someone's left hip. Vicki immediately stood up, put weight on her foot, started walking normally. Vicki had believed that Jesus was going to fix her hip and that she wasn't going to need surgery. He did what he promised he would do. That's an underline that. He did what he promised he would do. Praise be to the Lord Jesus Christ. He will do what he promises to do. In that story, there was a real profound revelation. Uh, I belong to God. When, when you get to that point where you realize, well, I'm actually his. Everything happening to me, it's, it's happening to him as well. And in that, he took it all away. God laid on him the sickness of us all. He bore our infirmities. He's carried away our pain. This is what the Bible says. When you have that realization, well, then you get all the faith you need to believe for healing. Because if Jesus has taken it away, well, that means it's gone. Let's believe. Let's believe in the sacrifice. Let's believe in his blood. Let's believe in the healer of your body. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we come to you. We come to you believing just as little children what you have promised you will do. You are a good father. What you have promised you will do. And your promise is to forgive all our iniquities and heal all our diseases. So we come to you believing and we come to you receiving and we ask that you would stretch forth your hand and do miracles. Fill us, Lord God, overflowing. Fill us with your love, your mercy, and your spirit. For we ask it in Jesus' name. There's someone you have a, a twisted intestine, and it's remarkably painful. God is unwinding all of that for you. Uh, you're, everything with your digestion is going to be normal. You just felt peace go into your innermost being in Jesus' name. Be healed and be made whole. And there's someone else. Your issue is that you have these air sacs in your lungs that are infected. And to this point, nothing has helped. But today is your day. Jesus is healing you. That infection is going to just begin to slowly go away, and you will be completely well and able to breathe freely. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what this is, but in, in your right side of your neck, there's a vein that's clogged, or an artery that's clogged, or a vein that's clogged. God is able, and he is releasing you from all of that. He's dissolving it all away. You don't have to live in fear anymore. You don't have to live with that pain, that swelling. In Jesus' name, be healed and be made whole. If you've been healed, let us know. Let us share in your good report. Give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. We're here to pray for you, so if you need prayer, just call us. Here's a word from Zechariah, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. God bless. We'll see you tomorrow.